rest is pretty good. If you're not answering emails, you better get to Alright, the rest? I couldn't interrupt, right? Get, gonna get going here. Welcome to the last lecture. I, I will only interpret that positively. Um, all right, so um, remember me, Mr. Obsessed with Microbes. Um, so, uh, like I tried to do before, um, where we've been before are talking about, most recently, all sorts of things that I don't understand. Um, big, furry, and leafy things, um, or fish in particular. Um, and today we're going to talk about symbioses in more detail, and I'm going to try and connect together many of the different groups of organisms that we've talked about in the class. And then, of course, the last thing you have to do is the final. Um, for uh, the final, A through L is going to be in 1, 2, 3, Silec, um, and M through Z in Rock Hall. And same as always, bring a pen, a number two pencil, and an ID. Shh. Um, please fill out the online evaluation system. There is, if you have not done it already, or even if you have, there's a bit of a strange glitch in the system. Um, it lists Jeff Ben instead of Susan Keen. Just please ignore that part. We haven't been able to get rid of that, um, but please uh, ignore it and fill out the rest of the evaluation. We really do use the information from these evaluations in future 
course discussions and course design. So it really does help to um, fill them out and, and fill them out with, you know, true information. Um, so here's your first clicker question of the day. I mentioned this in the other section. There are people in the past who have gotten this wrong. You only get full credit for getting it correct. And I'm probably not going to give you a lot of time for this one. You, you can talk about it with whoever's you know nearby. All right, I am going to stop it very, very soon. All right, let's see how people did. Oh, no! There's... All right. Um, that's pretty good. In statistics, we call that all correct. Um, so uh, that's not so bad. All right, now moving on to the topic of the class. So what I want to talk about today is really two concepts, topics. I want to, shh. I want to talk about symbioses again. We've talked about them a little bit. We're going to talk about different versions of different forms of symbioses for the whole class today. And I'm going to tell them in the context of really one story, one topic. Um, and then right at, the little, right at the end, I'll tell you about one other little topic. But the, the first three quarters of the class, I'm going to focus on um, vineyards uh, and a particular feature associated with vineyards. But I also want to tell you about, this is in essence, a story about doing science and about sort of detective work associated with science. So if you're... Um, driving around Napa, or driving around really anywhere in Northern California where there are vineyards. Um, it's very beautiful when you look out and see a uh, you know, row of grape plants um, in some area. If you're driving along on the road, or if you're a farmer in a particular farm and you see this, that's not a good sign. So this is um, the leaves, the grape leaves here are uh, in trouble, and the whole grape plants over on the right are in trouble. Uh, there are many different things that can kill plants. There are all sorts of pathogens and drought and excessive you know, toxins and other things. But this is particularly bad because this is evidence for um, an infectious disease called Pierce's disease present in the grapes. And if they find Pierce's disease, for example, in some big uh, vineyard in Napa, the USDA is probably going to want to burn down the entire vineyard. Um, this is infectious, highly contagious, and can destroy uh, the grape plants or at least make the grapes that they produce pretty uh, nasty. So you really don't want to see this coming into Northern California. It has already spread uh, or been native in other parts of the country. Uh, in the U.S., it's thought to have been responsible for the, some of the destruction of Thomas Jefferson's grape crops. It's been around for a long time. Um, and Pierce's disease is a big, nasty problem that we would like to keep out of the vineyards that are not uh, yet infected with it. Um, Pierce's disease is actually really kind of an interesting disease. Uh, it's an uh, infectious disease caused by this bacterium called Xylella fastidiosa. And the name Xylella comes from the fact that this bacterium has been found in the xylem circulatory system in plants. So this is a cross-section of the xylem. I'm not sure if it's from grapes. I think it actually is. Showing little bacterial-like cells growing in the xylem where there's not really supposed to be uh, colonies and biofilms of random microorganisms in there. The Xylella... Um, fastidiosa eventually will cause lots of problems to the plant. I think there's a bit of a debate about exactly how it does it. It does produce some toxins 
that may be damaging to the plant. It also clogs up the circulatory system that also may limit you know, water distribution and nutrient distribution. Um, it's a big deal. This bacteria has been studied, uh, I don't know, maybe for about 20 or so years, maybe a little bit longer. If you're interested in this type of thing, many of the world's experts on Pierce's disease and the bacterium that cause it are at UC Davis or at uh, other UC schools. It's been of great interest, again, because of the, the vineyard issue. If you don't remember, um, this is part of the way I'm trying to tie together different parts of the class. The xylem circulatory system is the circulatory system that is distributing water and ammonia and other sort of micronutrients from the roots to the rest of the plant. It is basically, you know, roughly the equivalent to mineral water going around inside the circulatory system. Phloem is the circulatory system that distributes sugars and other organic compounds that are made in the leaves or associated with photosynthesis and distributes them uh, to the rest of the plant for direct use or for storage or for other properties. You should remember um, from Professor Keene's lectures what the xylem and phloem circulatory systems are. So this interaction between xylella and grape plants, and actually xylella infects many other plants, but let's just focus on grape plants, is a type of symbiosis. The symbiosis is two organisms that live in an intimate association with each other where at least one of them benefits. So, um, which class of symbiosis is this? Right, it's a parasitism. So the xylella is benefiting by, you know, having a home inside the plants and probably taking a diversity of nutrients and other things from the plants, but the plant is not benefiting. So one of the partners benefits, one of the partners does not. That's parasitism. So when people first uh, started to try and understand what was causing Pierce's disease, uh, you could take a sample from the infected plant nearby where you see the browning of the leaves, and after a while people realized, again, that there was this um, bacterial-like cells inside the xylem circulatory system. And so you can learn a lot from just looking at this system in the microscope. You can learn where the blockage might be, where these bacteria are growing. Are they preferentially growing in old parts of the plant and new parts of the plant? Are there any regions where they don't seem to work? You can expose the plants to a variety of um, potentially protective mechanisms and see if that affects which parts of the plant you see these bacteria-like cells. So field observations are really important, but as I mentioned before earlier in the class, one of the things that is very helpful to understand when you see a new putative microorganism in the environment is to understand what kind of microbe it is. So in general, can we use microscopy to discover, to understand which kind of microbe you're observing in here in the microscope? Is that a useful thing? So can you tell if this is an archaea or a bacterium? Can you tell if this is a proteobacterium or a cyanobacteria? Not really. It's very, very difficult with appearance. Um, and can you tell what it's doing in there? Can you tell you what biochemical activities are present, what functions are present by looking at it in the microscope? It's not very easy. Um, it's not remotely easy to do that. So one of the things that people do when you're interested in a particular microbe, when appearance is of limited value, is you try and grow the microbe. So if you can go to a sample where you think there's an interesting microbe, and if you can provide that microbe with food in the laboratory in controlled conditions, and you can get the microbe to grow, that's called culturing. And if you can do that, that opens up this massive window of opportunity of research tools that you can use to better understand that organism. You can look at its physiology, you can look at its biochemistry, you can look at its growth rate, you can um, look at its genome, you can do genetic experiments, you can do exposure to different chemicals. You can do all sorts of things if you're able to grow it in the laboratory. And fortunately for xylella, 
researchers were able to grow it in the laboratory. These are colonies of xylella growing on um, some plate where people provided with food, and that opened up a window to better understand the mechanisms by which um, xylella was causing Pierce's disease and what its sort of weaknesses would be. And eventually, although there were many things learned from the sort of just general culturing experiments, people maybe 10 years ago or so, um, a group of researchers based in Brazil sequenced the complete genome of xylella fastidiosa. They scanned through the genome, don't worry about the details here, they scanned through the genome and took each individual part of the genome, each individual gene, and then compared that individual gene to databases that people have developed of gene sequences from other bacteria where the function of that gene was known, and you can make predictions about the functions of every gene in the genome, if it works really well, or maybe half of the genes in the genome if it doesn't work perfectly well, but it still gives you a, a great leg up on understanding the biology of these organisms by growing them in the lab, extracting the DNA out of them, reading the entire genome sequence of the organism, and then doing various genome-based analyses. And this was very helpful in understanding xylella. There's all sorts of interesting predictions that they made about how it was interacting with plant hosts, about what it was producing that might be damaging them, about how it was avoiding their defense systems, and so on. Um, but uh, that um, is just sort of one part of the story, this parasitic interaction between xylella and the grapes, just this one little component of the symbiosis here. So one of the things that's important to think about is you just spent three weeks talking about animals. One of the key features of you know, most of the animals we talk about is muscles. They move around. So if you're an infectious agent like flu or tuberculosis or a variety of other infectious agents in humans or in other animals, the animals can help you transmit to another organism by moving around and interacting with that other organism. The grape plants that are infected with xylella they're not moving around very much, right? They're, you know, they may grow, they may contact other grape plants occasionally. Diseases can get transmitted by that type of contact. Occasionally diseases can get transmitted in the air. But what happens with a lot of plant diseases, as well as many animal diseases, is there's a vector that serves as an intermediate to pick up the disease from an infected plant and transmit it to an uninfected plant. And so I'm going to show you a little video here made in something like the 1870s, it seems, um, discussing uh, a vector, a really important vector for Pierce's disease um, that, that is a really big deal these days. California is one of the largest grape-growing regions in the world. Golden Sid's abundant sunshine and mild Mediterranean climate make it an ideal location for growing grapes. And the wines that come from these vineyards are prized the world over. A new invader that has the potential to cause serious damage now threatens the state's wine, raisin, and table grape industries. And it's already helped decimate the grape industries in Florida and Texas. And now it's California's turn to deal with this menace. This new intruder is an insect known as the glassy wing shot shooter. A native of the southeastern United States, scientists believe it was brought into Southern California in 1989 through infected nursery plants. Since its introduction, it has spread rapidly. So far, it's been found in 15 California counties, mainly in Southern California and the Southern San Joaquin Valley. Well, we're here in a Ventura County lemon orchard. Uh, an orchard is about five years old. And the concern here locally with agriculture uh, has been a new, a relatively new introduced pest species, the glass of wing sharpshooter. Uh, it occurred here in Ventura County uh, about 10 years ago when we first saw it, and uh, it has developed its populations over this last 10 years and has reached uh, 
to very, very large levels to where in young lemon trees such as this one here, uh, we can have populations of 50 to 100 or more insects uh, per tree. The adult insect is almost half an inch in length and is dark brown to black in color with a lighter underside. The upper part of the vice wing sharpshooter's head is marked with ivory or yellow spots that are visible when viewed up close. The insect gets its name from the semi-transparent wings on its back that are laced with reddish veins and the characteristic side-to-side -side motion it sometimes exhibits, similar to a sharpshooter aiming at a target. Vice wing sharpshooters are voracious feeders and they are not picky. They're known to feed on over 130 different types of plants. These pests usually feed on the stem of the plant rather than the leaves. They have remarkably strong mouth parts that are able to penetrate down inside the stem to the part of the plant that conducts water from the roots to the leaves. This tissue is known as the xylem. Because the fluid within the xylem is very low in nutrients, the glassy wing sharpshooter needs to consume large amounts of it in order to get enough energy to live and grow. When feeding, it excretes this liquid as a stream of small droplets that rain down the surfaces below after filtering out essential nutrients. In areas where the glassy wing sharpshooter populations are very large, a mist made up of these droplets can actually be seen. As this watery excrement dries, it leaves behind a white residue. The real threat from the glassy wing sharpshooter is not from the damage it does directly, but from a disease that it helps to spread. A glassy wing sharpshooter can carry a bacteria that causes Pearson disease. All right, so um, this insect is basically feeding on xylem because xylem is so nutrient poor, it's basically mineral water with tiny little bits of organic compounds that is what the sharpshooter is trying to get out of the system. It basically functions like a straw with a filter on it. So it's sucking up water and pumping out water and trying to keep a little bit of organic material, sugars, maybe a few other things, during when it's doing this consumption. Um, and it's, uh, this Pierce's disease is such a big deal and this sharpshooter is such a good vector of Pierce's disease that it is the only animal listed by the Department of Homeland Security as a bioterrorism agent. Um, people are worried that someone is going to introduce infected sharpshooters into Napa Valley, for example. And that would cause billions of dollars of economic damage if it spread Pierce's disease into some of the vineyards there. So it's sort of been a topic of lots and lots of research um, because of the potential damage or the actual damage that it is um, wreaking. And um, this feeding on the xylem circulatory system, picking up a bacteria from inside the circulatory system and spreading it to an uninfected plant, that's very similar to what we see in animals with many uh, organisms such as mosquitoes transmitting Malaria, the causative agent of malaria is a plasmodium species in the apic complexin group. You all remember that, right? Um, and when a person is infected with malaria, a mosquito comes and drinks from their blood. It can pick up the plasmodium and then eventually transmit it to another person when it feeds on another person. That's basically the same thing that's going on with the sharpshooter serving as a vector to transmit Pierce's disease between plants. And for reasons that I'm, I'm not 100% sure about, there are lots of xylem feeding insects. There are many that potentially can transmit Pierce's disease. The sharpshoot, the glassy winged sharpshooter is exquisitely good at this transmission. Um, oh, so just to, you know, gross you out a little bit. Um, when, you know, they said in that, in, in that video, the lemon trees had an average about 50 sharpshooters in them. There was a big infestation that happened, I think, in Tahiti of glassy wing sharpshooters that were introduced probably on some ornamental plant. There were millions of sharpshooters in some of the trees. Um, this is what happens when there are millions of sharpshooters in some of the trees. It's 
called Tree Rain. I don't think they know what it is, you know, they're, I don't think any people were harmed in the filming of this, but, um, but you know, they're basically these, you know, it's sort of like sticking a uh, straw into the xylem, and if there are a million of them, you're going to have water being pumped out all over the place. Um, so, an interesting thing that may help explain why the sharpshooter is so good at transmitting xylella is that when people have you know, thought about or looked at some of the biology involved of these organisms, um, you might think, with no other information, that the symbiosis, so this is a symbiosis, the sharpshooter interacts with xylella in a very intimate way. It seems like it might be just some sort of commensalism where the xylella benefits by being transmitted between hosts and the sharpshooter is indifferent to this interaction. But many researchers think there may actually be a mutualistic interaction here where the xylella may be growing and living inside the sharpshooter. It's not just serving as a vector. And the xylella may be providing some benefit to the sharpshooters, which may help explain why sharpshooters are such good vectors at transmitting um, the, this bacterium that causes Pierce's disease. So again, let's go back to the circulatory systems of plants. If you, you know, plants colonize onto the land, you get these land plants growing, eventually you get the vascular plants. Um, some of them are small, some of them are getting to be big. You have the evolution of animals happening, you know, some of them diversifying at the same time. Let's just say you have an insect species that is starting to evolve the means to poke holes into a plant. Uh, through the surface of plants and get into the circulatory system. As a default, which of the two circulatory systems would you prefer to feed on? Phloem. It's got all the nutrients. It's got sugars. It's got organic compounds. It's got probably vitamins and other things being made in, um, and distributed to the rest of the plant. And um, in fact, there are a lot of organisms that specialize on feeding on phloem. So many so that there have been probably responses by plants to try and deal with these organisms feeding on phloem. So one of the responses would be to make the, the skin, the, the outer coating, um, tougher to get through, to secrete waxes or other compounds that make it harder to get into the phloem uh, circulatory system. You can fill up the phloem with toxins, that's what a lot of plants do, um, that make it uh, you know, poisonous to feed on their phloem circulatory system. You can have thorns. There's lots of means by which plants have tried to evolve ways to defend against phloem feeding um, insects. One of the really interesting mechanisms involves removing nutrients from the phloem that animals need to survive. So we didn't talk about this a lot in detail, but in all of the, the animal groups, let's just focus on insects, but this is true for most of the metazoa, they're unable to synthesize certain compounds that we need for our lives. We're heterotrophic, we don't fix carbon, we need to get sugars from our environment. We also don't make all the amino acids that we need for our proteins. There's a group of amino acids known as essential amino acids that animals can't synthesize. Animals need to get a variety of other chemical compounds, um, vitamins, cofactors, nitrogen, etc., from their environment. So one thing that plants have done in response to phloem feeding is to remove essential animal nutrients out of phloem. And despite that, there are still phloem feeding insects. Um, so this is an aphid. Aphids are really good at feeding on phloem. In fact, they've been incredibly successful at feeding on phloem. Um, there are 4, 000, at least 4,000 species of aphids, uh, that, and they're all obligate, basically all obligate phloem feeders. If you go to look at you know, a rose plant growing somewhere around here at the right time of year, and you look at the newly growing parts of the plant, um, you can find millions of aphids. Uh, infesting those plants usually. Um, they're found all over the planet. 
and are, again, very, very successful in terms of total numbers and very successful in terms of the number of species that have evolved. So um, a big question has been, what are aphids now doing in response to plants pulling the essential amino acids out of the phloem? So if you're going to obligately only feed on phloem, or let's just say you're feeding on phloem, what can you do if there are few no essential amino acids in the phloem? Well, you could eat other, other things. So there are many animals, insects um, out there that will feed on phloem occasionally, but also get other nutrients from other sources and therefore supplement their diet. You could, in theory, evolve a metabolic pathways that would allow you to synthesize the amino acids that no other animals can make. It appears that this is very hard to do. We see no cases of this in the animal world. Um, animals have not, uh, anywhere that I know of, been able to evolve synthetic pathways for the essential amino acids. What aphids do, and what many other animals that would obligately feed on such a low nutrient uh, food source do, is they find some other organism to make up for what they're missing and to synthesize the missing compounds for them. And in aphids, I'll tell you about the whole history of this, um, but what they're doing is they have a symbiosis with bacteria that live inside their gut, and the bacteria make things that they're not getting in the phloem diet. This was um, worked out largely due to the work of um, a few scientists, including Paul and Linda Bauman, who were professors at UC Davis for um, something like 30 years, studying uh, sap feeding insects and trying to understand how they were able to survive off these nutrient poor sap. Uh, if you dissect aphids and you look inside their gut, you can see these massive, actually, they're now called organs. Um, and if you look inside these organs, you see um, what appear to be bacterial cells inside those organs. They're a little bit weird looking, but they certainly resemble uh, bacterial cells in some way, much like mitochondria and chloroplasts resemble bacteria. They have some unusual features, but they have sort of the membrane structure and the shape and some of the other features that look like bacteria. Paul Bauman and Linda Bauman and others said, okay, well, what are these? How can I figure out what these organisms are? That's going to help tell me a little bit about their biology. So if you do the field observations, it turns out for these um, particular microbes, it's very hard to figure out what they are from field observations, like with many other microorganisms. So they turn to trying to culture those um, bacteria that you, well, the organisms that you see here. No one has been able to grow those organisms that they saw in these organs um, in the aphids to this day. They are, they are very hard to convinced to grow in the laboratory, if not impossible. So that was not available to them. So what's an alternative to figure out what kind of microbes they are um, without being able to grow them or infer that from field observations? Right, so you can do ribosomal RNA PCR, build evolutionary trees, and that will tell you what kind of organism uh, is present in the samples. That's exactly what the Baumans did. They extracted DNA from these samples, ran PCR amplification of ribosomal RNA genes, made lots of copies of those genes present in the sample, read the sequence of those genes, compared the sequence of those genes to the sequences from other organisms and built a data matrix, an alignment of those sequences. Remember all this? Um, and then they built an evolutionary tree from that data matrix and the position of the sequences from the aphids in the evolutionary tree compared to organisms that we know something about tells you what kind of organism they are. When they did this, this is the evolutionary tree that they got. Um, the symbionts of the aphids that they were looking at are right here. They're in a part of the evolutionary tree that corresponds to the proteobacteria. That's one of the phyla of bacteria that we talked about, you know, two or three years ago in ancient history in the class. I assume you all remember all about them. Um, even if you don't remember about the proteobacteria, one thing that turned out to be very fortunate, the bacteria in the aphids are very, very closely related to the best studied bacterial species on the planet 
Escherichia coli. And that meant that they could make many predictions about the biology of these organisms, even though they could not grow them in the laboratory. You can predict something based upon comparison to Escherichia coli. And they and other people did that for many years, working on the symbionts of aphids. There's, you know, 20 years of work. I am skimming over here. Eventually, a research group uh, sequenced the genome of one of these symbionts. They were named Buchnera, after a famous microbiologist who had been studying aphid uh, symbionts for many years, Paul Buchner. Um, so to do the genome sequencing, you do the same type of DNA extraction that you would do for PCR. You read um, random bits of sequence from the genome from your sample. You stitch it all back together using computational methods. And eventually, this group um, was able to piece back together the entire genome sequence of these Buchnera symbionts of, uh, of a particular aphid. And then you can predict what functions are present in the aphid symbiont genome by comparison to other organisms. Every single gene that they found in this aphid symbiont genome had a very closely related gene in the Escherichia coli genome. And that was great because Escherichia coli is the best studied bacteria on the, on the planet. Most of the genes in that species had at least something known about them. When they did this and tried to predict all of the metabolic functions present in the genome of this bacterium. Basically, what it came down to is these bacterial symbionts that live inside aphids make all the essential amino acids missing from the diet of the aphids. And they do virtually nothing else. They do replication, transcription, translation, and synthesize buttloads of amino acids and pump them out and feed the aphids. The aphids feed them sugars that they're collecting from the phloem. The aphids feed them um, non-essential amino acids or nitrogen compounds to give the symbionts the backbone, the nitrogen that they need to synthesize these other essential amino acids, and that's it. They're basically, um, that's probably why no one has been able to culture them. They don't have a lot of the functions that you would need to live in the outside free world, but they're living inside cells, inside the gut of these aphids. They don't need um, anything really other than sugar and some nitrogen. So it's another sort of symbiosis involved in sap feeding uh, insects. What type of symbiosis is this between the aphids and Buchnera? It's a mutualism. Um, they're both benefiting from this interaction. So now, um, now we finally get back to the sharpshooter. The sharpshooter has only become a big problem or a big fear in the last 20 or so years. It's been around for a while, but people have been much more worried about it in the last 15 to 20 years. Um, there wasn't quite as much work on xylem feeding insects as there was on phloem feeding insects. Af aphids are a massive problem to a lot of different plants and were very well studied, but um, people were certainly interested in these xylem feeding insects because what on earth could they be doing? They're feeding on mineral water. How are they able to survive when they're basically drinking this stuff that has almost nothing of value in it? Um, just like with phloem, plants have yanked out of xylem almost anything that would be of any use to an animal. It's very low. I mean, it, you can find very small amounts of a variety of things that are being transported in xylem. There occasionally are organic compounds, amino acids. It's very, very rare. Um, there's very little stuff to, for an animal to survive. Yeah. Yeah, so if they're taking everything out of their entire circulatory system, how do they distribute anything? So the xylem is mostly to distribute water. So they don't really need the xylem to distribute other things. And if you have a, a problem with xylem-feeding organisms, you can take out even the occasional other thing that was sort of moving around the xylem. Phloem, what many plants have sort of evolved to do is to distribute um, amino acids in phloem, but not the ones that are essential to animals. And then in other parts of the plant, when you start to make you know, proteins, they can convert the, the other amino acids into the essential amino acids that they need. 
and other parts of the planet. So they're, they're basically in a constant struggle with exactly your question. What can I move around inside the phloem that um, isn't going to be really great for some animal to feed on, but is it going to compromise my ability to survive? OK, so um, despite feeding on this really nutrient-poor solution, Xy obligate xylem feeding insects are also very successful. There's tons of species of sharpshooters and their relatives. Cicadas are in the same group. Cicadas uh, as adults are obligate xylem feeders. You can see the xylem puncturing proboscis here on this cicada. They've been very successful. You can ask the same question, what should xylem feeding insects do? Um, to deal with the fact that they're feeding on really nutrient-poor solution. They could eat other things. They could evolve metabolic pathways or find some symbiont to work with. Again, like with the phloem feeding insects, um, what the xylem feeding insects are doing is working with symbionts to help make up for what they don't get in their diet. Uh, Paul Bauman also started to look at these xylem feeding insects. This is a sharpshooter, not the glassy wing sharpshooter, but another one. And you can see these massive organs called bacteriomes uh, associated with their gut that are chock full of what appear to be bacteria inside these bacteriomes. Um, and uh, maybe about um, 10 or so years ago, uh, one scientist who was really interested in the evolution of symbioses Nancy Moran, who was at, I think, University of Arizona then, started to collaborate with Paul Bauman to study the biology of these xylem feeding insects. Nancy Moran is, is there a question or, no. Um, Nancy Moran is one of the most incredibly brilliant scientists around. Um, she won a MacArthur Prize, she's won the Japan Prize. When she gets interested in something, uh, people should listen. Um, Paul Bauman certainly did. They developed a collaboration to characterize the, what was living inside these um, bacteriomes and the xylem feeding insects. What did they do? Same type of thing. Field observations weren't very useful because the appearance wasn't informative. They couldn't culture any of the organisms. They turned to DNA again, just like with the aphid symbionts. They extracted DNA from these tissues, ran ribosomal RNA, PCR, read the sequence of those ribosome RNA genes, built a data matrix, built an evolutionary tree, and they found um, this is the symbiont from the glassy wing sharpshooter. Nancy Moran named it after Paul Bauman uh, in a paper that she wrote. Uh, so it, the name of this bacteria is Baumania cicatolinicola. Um, it's very closely related to the Buchnera symbionts of the aphids. Um, these are actually symbionts of other insects, but we're not going to talk about them here. And again, they're all closely related to Escherichia coli, which makes it relatively easy compared to other organisms that you've never grown to make predictions about their biology. Um, there were lots of stories, lots of excitement at UC Davis when she named this uh, organism after Paul, ba Paul Bauman. Just like with the Buchnera symbionts of aphids and with the Xylella pathogens, one way to get a better understanding of the biology of these organisms is to sequence the genome. That's where I come into this story. So I'd known, when I was a graduate student, actually, I'd known Nancy Moran. Um, we had communicated a little bit because she wanted some help with PCR primers that I was designing for trying to clone genes out of symbionts. And I was now at a genome center that specialized in doing genome sequencing. And I got an email, actually, from Nancy's husband Howard Ackman, who also studied insect symbionts, and then later from Nancy saying, hey, I, you're at this genome center. We'd really like to do some genome sequencing of the symbionts of xylem feeding insects. Are you interested? And I basically said, um, Nancy, I'd do anything you asked of me. Um, <laughs> she is just amazing. Amazing human being, brilliant. Um, uh, and we eventually wrote a grant proposal together, got a grant to sequence the genome of these Baumania organisms. Um, we got DNA from her. She FedExed it from Arizona to Maryland, where I worked. We took the DNA and eventually sequenced the genome of this Baumania 
Cicatolina coli. We predicted the functions present in the genome. We sat there with our, you know, coffee mugs, scanning through all the data, very excited, talking to Nancy on the phone, emailing Nancy, trying to tell her what we found. We found all sorts of pathways for synthesizing vitamins and cofactors. That makes sense. They are missing from the xylem diet, so this is an extra thing that xylem feeding insects need that phloem feeding insects don't. So that was really cool. This was one of the first cases of symbionts making vitamins and cofactors for a host like this. Alas, we found no pathways for synthesizing essential amino acids. Yeah. Um, so the question is, can you make plants resistant to these kind of pests if they make antibiotics that kill those kind of bacteria? In theory, you could. Some people have tried spraying antibiotics on some of these plants to kill the bacterial symbionts that live inside the insects. Unfortunately, just like people, plants have associations with lots of beneficial bacteria in other parts of the plant. So that actually doesn't work very well because you kill the other beneficial symbionts. So there are other methods that people have tried to use to control rather than antibiotics, but it's a, it's a great idea. Um, so we were very vexed by this. In fact, that's, that's what we felt like for a few years, um, or for a year or so, until Nancy sent me an email one day saying, oh, um, by the way, we have this new paper that we're working on. Here's a preprint of that paper. It's really interesting. We, um, continued to go after the glassy wing sharpshooter with better methods, and it turns out there's not just one bacteria that lives inside these tissues. There are two. You can't tell because, you know, the microscopy that you could do didn't really tell you much about what was present in this sample. This second bacterium is actually in a very different group of bacteria. It's in a phylum called the Bacteroidetes. I mentioned these briefly because they're known to be mutualistic symbionts of many mammals. Um, they named it Sulcia mulleri, and after many years of work from my lab and then from the lab of Nancy Moran later and a postdoc who had been in our lab, John McCutcheon, um, they were able to, we together were able to sequence the whole genome of this Sulcia symbiont, the second symbiont of the glassy wing sharpshooter, and it is an essential amino acid synthesizing machine. So basically what you have, and then this was done later when we could, Nancy could color stain the different bacteria with ribosomal RNA probes for the different organisms. This is Salsia in the gut. Salsia is making essential amino acids. This is Baumania. Baumania is making vitamins and cofactors. And together, they make everything missing from the glassy wing sharpshooter diet and allow the sharpshooters to survive on this incredibly nutrient poor food. So this is actually a dual mutualism. There are two mutualistic interactions here, probably three, because it appears that both of the bacteria feed each other different components. So it's a three-way mutualism between two bacterial species and one insect species. Um, just at the end here, I want to briefly mention um, one other symbiosis. So we've talked about a lot of different symbioses, mutualistic symbioses here in the class. You should go through your notes and re-familiarize yourself with those. And in the last four minutes here, I'm going to tell you about one other really cool story. Um, in 1977, a bunch of geologists were interested in studying seafloor spreading. And after a bunch of observations, they eventually sent the Alvin submarine down into the bottom of the oceans where they thought there would be basically no life and they found the second highest density of biomass next to tropical rainforests, with these, in particular, dominated by these giant tube worms that Peter Wainwright mentioned in the class before. Um, they're really cool organisms. Uh, scientists from the Smithsonian had characterized these. Shh, was giving a talk at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute a few years later um, about these tube worms and this woman, a graduate student then, Colleen Cavanaugh, was in the audience. She actually worked on horseshoe crabs. Do you remember what horseshoe crabs are? Chelicerates? Um, oh, no, wait, are they arachnids or? They're chelicerates, right? Yeah, all right. See, I don't know anything about animals. Um, and um, what was amazing is this scientist gave this talk and said, these tube worms have no mouth. 
no digestive system. We have no idea what they're doing, but they have this weird giant organ that's filled with elemental sulfur. Colleen, as a graduate student, jumped up and down in the talk and said, oh, they must have chemoautotrophic sulfur-utilizing symbionts that live in that tissue, and they're going to function like plants, with the bacteria making all the things that these worms need that they're not eating in their diet. The, the Smithsonian researcher basically said, silly girl, um, what do you know? And then she got samples, and as a graduate student, had a paper in ni Nature and a paper in Science, proving that these were pure bacterial cultures inside these tube worms, where the bacteria were getting hydrogen sulfide and carbon dioxide from the worm, and fixing carbon and making everything that was missing from the diet of the tube worms, which is everything, because they didn't eat at all. Um, she then showed that this symbiosis existed in many other systems, like giant clams, other clams, snails, and um, we have uh, one and a half more minutes here. Just wait a second. Shh. The main reason I'm telling you this story, in addition to it being incredibly cool, well, two reasons. One is that this shows that ecosystems on Earth do not need light. This entire ecosystem is based upon chemosynthesis rather than photosynthesis. And the second reason I'm telling you this is Colleen was my undergraduate advisor. I got interested in microbes and in symbioses because I worked in her lab. And that got me access to the Alvin submarine. That's me collecting tube worms from the back of the submarine. Working with her uh, got me really interested in general in microbiology and in science. And what I want to end with here is to encourage everybody here to try and figure out a way to do research in some lab as part of your biology career here. It changed my life. So um, on that note, good luck on the test.